Hi everyone, in this video we're going to solve a pretty cool partial differential equation which is d2f by dx squared plus d2f by dy squared equals minus 169f. Now you'll start to understand towards the end of the video what's special about this number minus 169 and why this wouldn't really work out if we chose for example minus 170. So anyway, we're going to solve this equation subject to some certain boundary conditions, which are summarized um, over here. Right, so we've got four boundary conditions, and to understand what these really mean, I'm going to draw a little sketch of the xy plane. So let's have some axes. So we've got our y, uh, we've got our y-axis up here, and our x-axis here. And what these boundary conditions mean is that we can draw on a horizontal line like this, and a vertical line like that, and we've got a square whose edge, whose corners are defined by the origin at zero, um, and then this line which is x equals pi, and then this horizontal line which is y equals pi. What the boundary conditions mean is that if we evaluate the function anywhere along uh, the edges of this square, then we get back zero. In other words, uh, if we evaluate the function along this top side of the square, we get back zero, so f equals zero along that side. If we evaluate the function on the left side of the square, f is still zero. If we evaluate it on the bottom side of the square, it is still zero. And if we evaluate it on the right-hand side of the square, f is still zero. So that's what our boundary conditions um, mean. I think that's quite a helpful way of, of visualizing this. So let's go on with actually solving the PDE itself. We are going to use the separation of variables technique. So what we're going to do is look for a solution with a very specific form. So we've got our function f of x and y, which we're looking for. We're going to look for a solution of the form capital X of x times capital Y of y. So this capital X is a function that only depends on x, capital Y is a function that only depends on y, and so that's why we call this separation of variables, because we're assuming that the x's and the y's are not kind of mixed together, right? We can, we can write out f as the product of these two different functions. And so we just, we're just going to take this form of f, plug it back into the original partial differential equation, and uh, see what we get. So our first term is d2f by dx squared over here, right? And so if we evaluate that, if we differentiate this thing twice with respect to x, then, well, the capital Y term is not affected, right? Because that only depends on y. So we still have a, a capital Y uh, sitting around, but then we've differentiated the capital X twice with respect to x, so we get a d2x by dx squared. Notice I'm writing this as an ordinary d rather than a partial d now because capital X only depends on small x anyway. So we can just write that as an ordinary d. And then similarly, the second term d2f by dy squared, um, it's very similar, but the x's and the y's are kind of flipped around. So this time we get capital X times d2 capital Y by dy squared, and that's going to be equal to minus 169 times capital X times capital Y. All right, so we've got this XY over on the right, so why don't we divide a whole equation by that to simplify things a bit. What we're gonna end up with then is X double prime over X. I'm using some concise notation here so that double prime means the second derivative, right? So this X double prime is the same as D2X by DX squared. Um, and the second term is going to be Y double prime over Y. And that's just going to be minus 169, because we've divided out this, this xy. Okay, now we can make an interesting observation, which is x double prime over x. This is a function of small x only. There is no y dependence in there, by definition of capital X, right? Similarly, we've got y double prime over y, and we can say that that is a function of, sorry, lowercase y only, by definition of capital Y. Right, so we've got a function of x, and we've got a function of y, and this right-hand side of our equation is a constant, right? There is no x dependence, and there is no y dependence. So what we can deduce from this, actually, well, the only way that we can take a function of x and add on a function of y and get back something that doesn't depend on either of those variables is if our function of x is, in fact, a constant itself, and our function of y is in fact um, a constant itself as well, okay? Because if you have some x dependence, no matter what function of y you add onto that, you're never gonna cancel out that x dependence, okay? And so what we can deduce from that 
is that x double prime over x is some constant and for reasons that will become clear shortly I'm going to call that constant minus lambda squared okay so if you haven't seen this kind of problem before it might look a bit strange that we don't just write it as like k or something um, but if we choose to write it in this form it makes the algebra work out um, much more nicely and so we've got this constant minus lambda squared and we can also say by the same logic that y double prime over y has to be some constant which I'm going to write as minus mu squared okay and if we just take these two equations that we've got now okay the first one here only depends on x the second one here only depends on y what we find is if we just focus on the x case first okay this first equation here rearranges to give x double prime plus lambda squared x is equal to zero right um, now this equation may look familiar if you spent some time studying physics or some time studying ordinary differential equations this is an equation that comes up all the time this is the simple harmonic motion equation okay now that's why we chose to write the constant as minus lambda squared basically um, because then it, it ends up the equation comes out in the standard form um, of the SHM equation right and so uh, the solution of the SHM equation um, is going to be some combination of sines and cosines. so some constant a times sine of lambda x plus some other constant b um, times cos of lambda x okay I'm kind of quoting this result here the um, the solution of the simple harmonic motion equation and uh, so there's our general solution for capital X of x let's apply some boundary conditions now so if we take the boundary condition the f of 0 and y um, is 0 okay so that's our first boundary condition up there that's 0 what that means is um, that x of 0 times y of y for any value of y that has to be zero okay because f is just x of x times y of y and so if this is true for any value of y then what we have to have is that x um, of zero itself is just zero okay so our boundary condition we've translated the first boundary condition into a condition on capital x of x if capital x of zero is zero then um, what do we get well from our solution general solution for capital X here um, if we plug in those that boundary condition the left hand side is just zero uh, the right hand side is going to be a times sine of zero plus b times cos of zero sine of zero is zero cos of zero is one and so we find that zero equals b okay so b is zero in other words there is no cos contribution okay so let's apply another boundary condition um, which is f of pi and y is equal to zero right so the second boundary condition um, up at the top left there uh, what does this imply well um, via similar logic we know that that means x of pi times y of y is uh, zero but we also know that x of pi is going to be a sine lambda pi right because we found that this b coefficient the cos coefficient is zero um, so what this implies is that x of pi which we found is a times sine of lambda pi that has to be zero so this actually gives us a constraint on lambda okay so lambda is in fact an integer okay because the sine if we take the sine of an integer number of pi's then we get zero the solution of this for lambda is that lambda is just any any integer okay so we actually found our solution for capital X it's a sine lambda pi where lambda is an in integer uh, and then we don't have to go through the same thing for y by symmetry okay because the equation that y obeys is exactly the same it's also going to obey the SHM equation um, if we went through this exercise for y we would find the same result uh, for uh, capital Y and uh, and mu okay so right just to summarize all of that what we found is that capital X is proportional to sine of lambda X and capital Y is proportional to sine of mu Y by symmetry where lambda and mu are both integers now here's where things get kind of fun uh, there's actually another constraint on lambda and mu they're actually related okay so um, 
notice that, well, I want to go back to this form of the differential equation here. x double prime over x plus y double prime over y is minus 169. Okay, so we've got x double prime over x plus y double prime over y is minus 169, but we said that x double prime over x has to be minus lambda squared, right? Has to be a constant which we defined as minus lambda squared, so we can just replace that with minus lambda squared. Similarly, y double prime over y, we can replace that with minus mu squared, right? Because we said that y double prime over y is just minus mu squared. Um, in other words, because all of these terms have minus signs in front of them, that's the same as just saying lambda squared plus mu squared is 169, right? So lambda and mu are related by this constraint here. So what possible values of lambda and mu can we have um, that uh, satisfy this constraint? Well, uh, let's think about that. So we're looking for pairs of lambda and mu. Remember, they both have to be integers from the boundary conditions. We found that they have to be integers. Um, possible values are, um, well, now you see the significance of 169. 169 is 13 squared. And what we're actually looking for here is a Pythagorean triple, right? Because we add together the squares of two integers and we get 13 squared. And there is a Pythagorean triple, which is 5, 12, 13. In other words, 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. And so our possible values for lambda and mu um, are going to be um, 5 and 12, okay? Um, but they could, in principle, both be negative as well, right? So I'm going to put plus or minus there, because if you square a negative number, you get a positive number, okay? Um, or you could flip them around, right? You could have plus or minus 12, plus or minus 5, okay? Now, note that you could also have 0 and 13, right? Because 0 squared plus 13 squared is still 13 squared. But we don't have to consider that case, because if lambda is 0, or mu is zero, then our entire function is going to be zero, right? Because sine of zero is zero. If we take, for example, the fact that x is proportional to sine of lambda x, and we plug in lambda is zero, then we find that capital X is zero, and hence f itself is zero. So we don't have to consider the case where lambda is zero and mu is 13, or vice versa, because that just results in the function itself being zero. Okay, so we're actually very nearly done. Because what we have to do, we found our allowed solutions, and we just have to sum up all of those allowed solutions to get our most general solution. So our f is going to be the sum over all of the allowed values of lambda and mu of some coefficient, which we can call c subscript lambda mu times x of x, uh, which was proportional to sine of lambda x, okay? and then times y of y, which is proportional to sine of mu y. But we know that the allowed values of lambda and mu are given by these fives and twelves here. And so our final answer is going to be that f is some coefficient, let's call it alpha, times sine of 5x, sine of 12y. And then we have to add on a contribution from the 12-5 the, uh, uh, pair, right, rather than the 5-12 pair. So we add on some contribution, let's say beta times sine of... 12x sine of 5y. Okay, so uh, one final point to note is that I haven't included any contribution from these uh, negative pairs of lambda and mu because, well, sine of minus 5x times the sine of minus 12y is actually the same as sine of 5x sine of 12y because sine is an odd function. And so if we added those contributions uh, from the negative lambdas and mu's, we could just combine them together with the positive ones because, because they're equivalent, right? They're not actually independent um, solutions from each other. Um, all right, so there we go. And that's, uh, you know, if we'd chosen minus 170, for instance, we wouldn't have been able to find a pair of integer lambda and mu um, that satisfy this. So it really would have to be um, minus 169 or indeed any um, any number that is that is part of a, a Pythagorean triple, right? Um, so we could have done done it with three, four, and five, for instance. All right. So hope this has been interesting, and uh, see you again soon.